go. Right, good afternoon. Welcome to CMC Markets on the 22nd of May and this um, this weekly market update and a look ahead to the key events for this week. Sorry about the technical problems there earlier. Um, unfortunately, um, they sometimes happen, and um, hopefully, hopefully we we won't be having any more. First and foremost, let's go through the risk warning. Uh, anything you see in, in here today is should not be construed as trading advice. It's just an indication of key levels, key events, and um, hopefully a direction of travel in terms of what we can expect to see from the key market events uh, this week. Um, so we're going to start. I think we're going to start off with um, the events of the last the last week or so and, and the big declines that we saw in equity markets um, on the Wednesday of last week. Now since then we've we've come back quite considerably um, but I think there is a concern certainly on my part that um, we could this could be the beginnings of a little bit of a pullback in stock markets particularly US markets. Um, we have we have bounced back quite considerably from the lows that we saw um, at the tail end of last week and early Thursday, but ultimately we still remain below the lows that we saw, or sorry, the highs that we saw um, at the beginning of the month at 2,400 level. So I will be keeping a close eye on that particular level over the course of the next week or so, because while Mr. Trump may be embarking on a nine-day tour of the Middle East and Europe, ultimately he still faces the same problems that he was facing at uh, at the beginning of last week, and that is um, an investigation into um, his conduct with respect to James Comey, the former FBI chief, who will be, I understand, testifying um, on Capitol Hill on Wednesday of this week. So that's going to be, I think, um, I think that could be a key risk risk element or a key risk event in the event Mr. Comey comes out with some little nuggets of information that we aren't quite aware of. Um, from from what we heard last week. So the other key event this week will obviously be the release of the latest Fed minutes. They're due out on Wednesday. And while I don't expect them to be a significant market mover, I certainly think in the context of how Fed policymakers view the runoff their balance sheet, um, they they could actually um, signal signal um, a key change of policy. Um, if there is significant detail on what Fed policymakers are looking to do towards the end of this year. Now, at the moment, markets are pricing in the prospect that we will see a June rate rise. Now, I still think that it's too early to suggest that that is a done deal. And certainly, I think currency markets would appear to, to really bear that out. Um, if we if we look at um, this Bloomberg chart in particular on the dollar index that we've got here, we can we can see that this is where the Fed raised rates in December, this is where they raised rates in March, and we're now pretty much the lowest levels since before Trump won the presidential election on November the 8th. So the direction of travel I think for the dollar at the moment I think is clearly defined. We are very much looking towards a move back potentially I think to levels that we last saw at the beginning of November or around about those November lows of around about 96. That also mimics the behavior that we've seen in the US Treasury market as well. If we look at the US 10 year yield we're testing a very, very key support level around about 216. And that while we have seen a little bit of a rebound off that in the past couple of days, I think that's going to remain a very, very key level. And I think it's also interesting to note that, again, this is where the Fed raised rates in December. This is where the Fed raised rates in March. I think markets are still pricing in the prospect of at least another two rate rises this year. That could still happen. But ultimately, we're still quite some way away from where we were, say for example, a week ago where we were pricing in 100% probability that the Fed would potentially raise rates. If we look at, say for example, this chart here, 
this tells us that the market is pro pricing in 100% probability the Fed's going to raise rates on 14th of June. Well, we're quite some way away from that. And a week ago, or just around about three or four days ago, that dropped to around about 70% in the wake of the sell-off that we saw in equity markets on Wednesday. So that can move quite significantly between now and the 14th of June. I think those, hot, those odds there are way too high. If we look at the way currencies have moved over the past five days, we can also see that amongst the best performers over the past five days has been the euro. And again, I think that's largely as a result of changing expectations on the part of traders as to whether or not the, the European Central Bank will look at tapering monetary policy before the end of this year. Now, at the moment, the ECB remains full on dovish mode. We've still got the German elections coming up in September and um, we've still got the start of the Brexit talks, which is due to start on the 19th of June. We've also got a fairly decent or improving economic picture um, in the context of the economic data that we've got coming out of the euro area. And I will be particularly interested in, given the, the, given the, the rally that we've seen in the euro over the course of the past few days, and particularly in the past, since the beginning of May, um, as to whether or not we've got further to go in the context of further euro gains. And certainly on this chart, there is certainly potential for us to go quite a bit higher. We've got the November peaks at around about 113. We've also got the September peaks just above that. And we've also got the August peaks just above that. So we're certainly running into an area where the European Central Bank's not likely to be particularly pleased that the euro is heading back towards 113 and 114. They really do want a weaker euro, notwithstanding the fact that a number of weaker European countries have got a whole host of debt rolling over in the June and July months. So I think we need to be careful about being overly bullish on the euro. They certainly won't want bond yields in the euro area to jump significantly higher. And I think expectations of a taper of monetary policy could actually result in exactly that happening because I think declining US rate expectations, rising ECB rate expectations, currently um, the deposit rate is minus 0.4%. I think if the data continues to improve, the ECB, the European Central Bank will find it doubly difficult to argue that their policy can remain loose when the, when the economic data continues to improve. So in particular, we'll be looking at the GDP numbers tomorrow for German GDP. And that's the final number for German GDP for the first quarter. That's expected to be confirmed at 0.6%. More importantly, we've got flash PMIs from manufacturing and the services sector for France and Germany. And they're both out tomorrow morning as well, around about 8 a.m. UK time and 8.30 a.m. UK time. And there, for May, these are the numbers for May, these are still expected to show fairly decent levels of economic activity, not only in France, but also in Germany. So these numbers have come in mid-50s. Mid, mid, mid you're talking 55, 56. In Germany, you're talking 55 and 58. So those decent numbers will feed into a narrative of a continued improvement in the French and German economies. Against that backdrop, it's going to be very, very difficult for the ECB to argue that um, a loose monetary policy into next year is justified. You're certainly going to hear an awful lot more German monetary policy makers arguing that monetary policy needs to be a little bit tighter. So that's, that's, that's the narrative that I will be looking at going forward over the course of the rest of the week. And certainly we'll be looking for any indications on Wednesday when President Draghi, ECB President Draghi, will be talking and looking for clues as to whether or not he's being pushed into a corner with respect to moderating the tone of any monetary policy announcement that could be coming down the pipe. So 
It's all about expectations. The ECB can argue till it's blue in the face that it's going to keep monetary policy loose. But if the data continues to improve, they're going to make it. They're going to find it much more difficult to argue that case. And that's why we're seeing the gains that we're seeing in the euro over, and have seen in the euro over the course of the past couple of weeks. We can see that here. We've only had one down day in, in the past six or seven. So upside momentum is clearly in the euro's favour and that's no better borne out not only in euro dollar but also in euro sterling where um, much against my expectations we have broken out to the top side on that as well we can see that on the daily chart we've broken above the 200 day moving average we've broken above the 50 and we've broken above the 100 so there's a significant breakout taking place on euro sterling and as such we could well see further gains going forward but if we actually draw a line through these peaks here we could find once again upside progress start to run into a little bit of a wall around about 87.10 which also happens to coincide with the peaks that we saw at the end of March. There's also we also got to bear in mind the fact that we've got the election coming up and the the difficulties that we saw over the weekend with respect to that botched announcement on social care which caused the conservative lead in the polls to slip from a double digit lead into a single digit lead of around about nine or ten percent um, has caused a little bit of sterling weakness also combined with the fact that David Davis Brexit secretary reiterated the possibility that the UK could leave without a deal if they were held to a Brexit bill of around, you know, or anywhere between 50 and 100 billion euros. So that's prompted a little bit of sterling weakness today um, and that failure at that 130 level. What, it, what is notable, though, is that even though we've struggled to break above 130.40, we haven't really dipped too far. We saw a very strong move on Friday. We've seen a little bit of weakness today against the dollar. But ultimately, my long-term target for the pound is still at this 133.20 level. I published a piece on it on Wednesday or Thursday of last week, which you can find on the website in the news and analysis section. Um, this, this triangle breakout that we saw, that we saw um, in April, in mid-April, um, it's still very, very valid in terms of the move higher. As long as we hold above this, this series of lows here, around about 128.40.50. 130.40 is currently capping the gains at the moment. But as long as we stay, I think, above 128.40 and more immediately 127.50, then the upside momentum should in all likelihood take us all the way back to 133.10. Now, of course, whether or not that um, happens before the election, I think is unlikely. Um, but I think in, in, in the aftermath of the election, um, we could well see the, the pound continue to, ground, to, ground, to grind higher. And now, whether that's as a result of dollar weakness or sterling strength is neither here nor there. The, the thing that I'm looking for at the moment is further sterling strength against the dollar. Now, I've just been asked about sterling kiwi. So I will cover that for you right now while I've got um, while I've got sterling on my mind. We've seen some big gains in sterling kiwi today, but at the moment we still remain in this sideways consolidation for sterling kiwi. And at the moment, while we're in this sideways consolidation, the likelihood is that we're likely to continue. So the key levels that I'll be looking for on sterling kiwi, I'm going to highlight here for you. So 186.06 on the downside and 188 189 on the top side so that's your trading range on sterling kiwi if we break out of that range then we could well see a sharp move higher or lower of around about 250 300 points that's essentially what we're looking for here now that could be a flag we've had a strong move higher if we break out of that flag formation then we will probably get another two or three hundred point move higher or lower uh, depending on the direction of the breakout but it's important 
that you don't try and preempt the breakout because at the moment it does appear to be a little bit of a sideways trading range and until such times as we get a significant breakout of that if you're either long of sterling kiwi your stop loss is going to be around about 185 and a half if you're if you're looking to trade higher than any stop losses on short positions around are likely to be around about 189 30 189 40 50 so trade the range until we get the break is probably the wisest strategy if you're looking at trading sterling kiwi so we've covered we've covered euro dollar we've covered cable we've covered euro sterling let's have a quick look at um, dollar yen because again i think that's a decent arbiter of dollar strength or dollar weakness and we saw a big big decline yesterday we rebounded from the 120 11020 area and again that's likely to be a key support level but what we've got here is I'm paying attention to these three daily candles here ladies and gentlemen these on, on this on this particular day here here and here I'm going to drill down into that and we can see that's around about 11160 11170 so I think with respect to dollar yen as long as we stay below 11180 then we could well have a look, another look at 110, 20, 30. But even if we do break above 111.80, we're going to find a little bit of resistance around about 112.40, which is this area up here, in and around this sort of level here. The four hour chart is starting to roll over a little bit, so we could see that start to roll over. But looking, looking at this particular chart here, the top of this cloud resistance here, should act as a bit of a cap so anywhere around 11180 112 decent resistance on the dailies um, and on the downside we've got 110 20 but the bias i think still remains for a slightly lower dollar in the short to medium term simply because people are still trying to pick the base in the dollar they still i think they still remain fundamentally bullish on it and i'm not i don't i don't totally buy into that given the given the behavior of us bond yields and the look and the look and feel of that dollar index chart and until such times as i see evidence of a reversal i'm not going to try and catch a falling knife i think the trend at the moment is for a weaker dollar and the, and, the, and the wisest course of action with respect to that is to look to trade it in that context not try and buy not, not try and look not try and pick a base on it i think that can be very, that can be a particularly dangerous pastime um so so that's dollar yen so that, that sort of brings us all together and now let's talk about commodities and the effect that they're likely to have on the aussie dollar we've seen a little bit of a pickup in the aussie in the past few days and that can be borne out by this particular chart here let's have a look at the four hour chart to drill down into the detail and we're coming into a little bit of a resistance area in the short to medium term but it's quite clear at the moment that uh, the Aussie is benefiting from a slightly weaker dollar. We have started to edge above the highs for the past few days. And I think a large part of that is probably down to the fact that um, we've seen a little bit a little bit of a rebound in iron ore prices. I think that's helping to a, to a greater or lesser extent. But overall, we were also very oversold on the Aussie dollar as well. We've come down from the March peaks of around about 77.5. And we could well retest this area around about the 74.80, 74.90 area to see whether or not there's appetite to either start to sell or take a little bit of profit on the gains that we've seen in the past week or so. Certainly looking, looking at the Aussie dollar on a daily or a weekly chart, there is significant resistance coming in around about that 75 area. So I'll be very interested to see how it reacts around that sort of level and whether or not there's a significant number of short positions starting to get built up on, on a retest of those particular peaks. Also on the past week, or so, also coming up this week, we've got OPEC. We've talked about the FOMC minutes, but we've also seen a significant rebound in crude oil prices. Now, uh, the big question I think that most people are asking, me included, is that will this OPEC announcement be a classic case of buy the rumour and sell the fact. I think there's an awful lot of expectation that OPEC will announce some form of deal on the 25th of May. 
The big question will be, will it be nine months or will it be some sort of fudge? Now, Saudi Arabia have suggested that they, there is support and Russia have suggested that there is support for an extension of the current output cap or freeze into March 2018. Quite how they square that with rising US rig counts is another matter because ultimately if they continue to pull back from producing oil and the demand is there all it's doing is giving US shale producers an open goal to shoot through and I'm not sure that Saudi Arabia who have been the biggest cutters when it comes to oil production will be particularly happy with that particular outcome and there's also no I don't think there's any um, any clear indication as to whether or not Iran will sign up to a further nine months of price freezes or price caps. So we've seen some fairly decent gains over the past week or so, uh, but all within the context of the range that we've been in over the course of the past six to nine months. Yes, we did make a little bit of a, a multi-month low um, a few weeks ago, but ultimately we're still within the broad range that we've been in since the beginning of the year which is around about 45 55 in terms of oil prices and we are starting to look a little bit overbought we could extend up to 55 or even the april highs around about 56 57 dollars a barrel but certainly in the context of where we are now i think that the oil price is being helped in no small part by a weaker dollar so that's that's been that's providing a little bit of a headwind for the oil price as well a weaker dollar um, helping push the oil price up towards the previous peaks but I think the OPEC announcement will be key I think in the context of expectations and at the moment expectations are fairly high that we'll get something in the region of nine months and that obviously is also helping um, the FTSE 100 which continues to push the upper ends of its recent ranges unlike um, European equity markets which have significantly underperformed now last week I talked about the potential for a key reversal day um, and we do appear to be potentially negating that. The big question for me I think is whether or not we're able to retest these two peaks here. So you've got 75.34, 75.35, so you're looking really at 75.40. This key reversal will be negated if we push back above those two peaks around about 75 35 75 40. at the moment it still looks very very overbought but i still have my doubts as to whether or not it's in any way sustainable because one of the things i have noted is that if you look at all of the key asset classes and all the key markets over the course of the past six to seven months the us dollar has given up its trump bump US yields have given up its Trump bump. Gold prices have recovered from their Trump loss. And the only markets that actually haven't been affected by all of this uncertainty about Donald Trump and the fiscal plans and the deliverability of fiscal reform and what have you are equity markets. So the big question is, no, there's been no disappointment reflected in equity markets with respect to the deliverability of Trump's fiscal plans and I don't see that there's any way now that he'll be able to deliver deliver on any of the reforms or anywhere close to what the market is pricing in the big question is have we seen the top are we going to see a bit of a sell-off in the over the course of the next few months or are we going to trade sideways into the summer one stat I would put out there and it is just a stat but it's quite interesting is that for the last 40 years Every year that ends in a seven has seen a stock market crash. 1987, 1997, 2007, all seen stock market crashes. And guess what? We're in 2017. We haven't seen one yet, but there's not, that's not to say that we won't. So it's certainly worth considering when you consider the volatility is at multi-year lows. We're due one. The big question is, when does it come? So that suggests to me that you need to be careful when it comes to being overly long of the market we are overdue a stock market correction unfortunately we just don't know when it's going to come but it's interesting to note that all of those stock market crashes 
happened in the autumn between September and November 1987, 1997 and 2007. So worth bearing in mind as we head towards the back end of this year. Right, so what else are we looking at? Let's have a quick look at gold because I think that's always a nice little um, that's a nice little market to have a look at. And as we can see again, this was the Trump slump in gold um, as markets started to price in the prospect of multiple US rate rises as well as the significant stimulus plan from the Trump new Trump administration. Since then we've pretty much gone one way. Um, haven't totally recovered all of the losses that we've seen since the beginning of November, but we're certainly heading in that direction and heading towards um, the 1260, 1270 area. So 1260, there's a little bit of resistance. We can see it through here. But what is noticeable is that momentum has started to turn positive on the moving averages, which would suggest that any dips on gold prices are likely to find support at around about 1240. And below that, at around about this trend line support, around about 1220. So we could get a little bit of a drift back lower on, on gold, but 1240 could well act as a, a nice little support level in the short to medium term. Okay, just looking at my notes, so let's have a quick look at the um, let's have a quick look at the DAX. We haven't looked at that yet, so we'll have a look at the DAX. And once again, we had a little bit of a sell-off, but again, the uptrend is still intact. Seen two sharp sell-offs this month but we've still managed to hold above this 12,380 level and that for me I think is the line in the sand for the DAX. While we're above that then we're going to get some decent rebounds but if we break below that then we could potentially see a little bit of a double top but then again we could also then drop back into the range that we were, been, that we were in between the months of March and April and I think this has really been symptomatic of the way equity markets have been um, over the course of the past few months. Huge amounts of optimism are priced in and they're not priced in anywhere else. And I think that's the, th that's the one bit of divergence that I think worries me as a little bit as a, as a market analyst. I like to see markets correlate. And at the moment we're seeing a significant amount of divergence between equity markets and bond markets and currency markets. And that makes that sits a little bit uncomfortable with me. So be cautious when it comes to trading equity markets because equity markets are telling a completely different story to bond markets and currency markets. Other key events later this week we have UK first quarter GDP first revision and US first quarter GDP first revision. Now with the UK GDP number we're not expecting any revision at all 0.3% might might see an upward revision to 0.4. US first quarter GDP expecting a revision from 0.7% to 0.9%. That's still um, a lot less than what we were originally expecting when the first quarter revision came out earlier this year. That was ex We were expecting in the number in the region of around about 1.2, 1.3. In the event, we only got 0.7, so we're expecting to see a slight upward revision to 0.9, but that's still well below what we were expecting at the beginning of the year. Other key events later this week. We've got a number of Fed policymakers due to speak, one of which is, this, is, is the dovish Mr. Neil Kashkari of the Minneapolis Fed. He has voted against, he voted against the March rate rise. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what he says on Tuesday night. What we've also got um, later this week is a number of other key US announcements, durable goods on Friday. We've also got um, UK public finances due later tomorrow, uh, around about 9.30 tomorrow, so the latest borrowing numbers, as well as CBI retail sales. So keep an eye out for them. And um, and I think that's pretty pretty much it for this week, unless anyone has any questions that they'd, like, they'd like to direct my way. Um, and any markets that I haven't covered already. In the absence of any feedback, there will be no webinar next week, incidentally, ladies and gentlemen, because um, it's the bank holiday. So the webinar will return in June, where I will obviously have a look 
uh, to, or I'll give a preview of obviously the general election. Um, uh, but we will also we will be having non-farm payrolls obviously in the first week in June. So um, sign up for that one. But there will be no there'll be no webinar on the bank holiday um, next 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 week's bank holiday. But there will be a webinar next week where there'll be non-farm payrolls on the Friday. Well, we will we will be covering that live, or I will be covering that live with my colleague Colin Szynski at uh, 1:15. It starts at 1:15 on the Friday, first Friday in June. And then obviously we'll have the Monday after, and the Monday after will be the general election, and I'll obviously cover that, um, go through that, and um, talk about what to expect with respect to that. Otherwise, I'd like to thank you all for listening, and um, I will see you and speak to you all on the next webinar, which will be first Friday in June on farm payrolls. Thanks very much for listening, and have a good week trading.